yeah, that, that, that's a little thing my friend Sean, you remember, how many remember Sean? Some of you knew Sean. It's a little thing our friend Sean used to call the whale. Uh, it's supposed to look kind of like a you know, water spout <laughs> from a whale uh, in, in the ocean. Now, now the first, first time I saw this was at Noah's restaurant. Uh, and if you haven't been to Noah's, Noah, Noah's is, is, is not like uh, McDonald's or something, right? It, it, it's a, not, not a slam on McDonald's, but, it, it, you know, McDonald's is kind of informal. Noah's is a little more formal, right? It, 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 it's, a, uh, it's not a place where you go and shout and sing and have fun. Woo-hoo! You know, it's kind of a quiet, people are, are, it's kind of a romantic setting, you know, little candles and, and, and sophisticated. People kind of dress up. They act really civil and, and mind their manners and that kind of things. That, that's the setting at Noah's restaurant. So it was a little shocking when this guy I had just met just a few weeks earlier suddenly says, oh, watch this. <laughs> yeah, you know. And, of course, the whole table's laughing. And there was a bunch of us. I think it was our small, small group that was meeting there that night. And um, I was waiting to get thrown out of the place, <laughs> but uh, uh, we, we, we weren't. If, if you knew Sean, you know Sean is not the quiet a soft-spoken kind of guy that, that really sits nicely at a restaurant like Noah's. He was loud, uh, unruly, a little bit obnoxious, a whole lot of fun to be around. Uh, when, when he walked into a room, the party broke out. Whether there was one or not there before, I mean, it, it just happened. I mean, it, it, it just, it, people started dancing and talking. I mean, it, it was just a crazy thing. Now, now Sean is, a, is an Irish name. That, that means God is gracious, now, I don't, I don't know that his mom was thinking that when she named him Sean, you know, I, I, knowing his mom as well. Uh, I, I, I really doubt that was like part of her process. Oh, God is gracious. Sean, my little baby, you know. Uh, she probably just liked the sound of it. Uh, I, and I honestly don't remember. Maybe there was a family member with a name further back, uh, not that I'm aware of. But, but she, I think she just liked the name and, and called him, him Sean. When I met him, he'd spent the past 20 years or so, uh, being a DJ in, in bars. Uh, matter of fact, he, he had 10 DJs working for him when I met him. He, he kind of owned the city of Des Moines at, at the time uh, in, in the DJ world. He worked weddings and corporate events and schools, and he, he, just, he was out there doing DJ, DJ stuff all the time. He was a bouncer. He's a, he made me look small. Right? I'm, I'm a fairly large guy. Maybe that's why I liked him, because I, like, I was like a little brother. I was like, hey, hey buddy, you know, and he could just, he, 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 he was a strong, he was an ox, right? He, he, if he wanted to, I tried to keep my distance so it couldn't happen. He could literally pick me up by my neck and just lift me with one arm, just, you know, he could, and I could dangle. I mean, I know he could have, and I think he tried once or twice, um, but I kept my distance from him to make sure that that didn't happen. So he was large. <laughs> When I met him, he was over 600 pounds. Put it in kind con- large. He was a large man. Uh, he lost quite a bit uh, uh, through the years. Uh, strong. I have to say, the most confident man I've ever known in my uh, in- entire life. He also had spent the 20 previous years to me meeting him intoxicated, uh, trying to medicate some anger in his life. His, his father died when he was a young man, when his father was young as well, but when, when Sean w- was young and he was angry and didn't know how to process this. Why would God do this? And rather than process and deal, he just dove into to his bar scene and dove into alcohol and spent most of that time in, intoxicated. Um, but I knew him after that. I knew him as he was coming out of that. Uh, I I met him when he was first getting to know Jesus. I mean, matter of fact, he was at a DJ event and someone from church said, hey, you got to come to church. And he's like, yeah, we don't don't do the church thing. Ah, you'll like this one. And he he came to church and uh, we just started spending a lot of time together. And, and he was asking questions about Jesus and and scripture and, and, and and he, something clicked, something clicked at at that point in, in his life. And he thought, I, I, I've, got, I've got to make some changes. I've, I've got to start doing things differently. And, and so uh, I spent a, a number of years really, um, I was, I was going to say introducing him to Jesus. I guess it started there. I mean, he, he was introduced before, but, but getting to know who Jesus is. And everything in his life changed. Everything. 
Matter of fact, some of the stories I could tell you that he told me that I didn't see, but he told me, you'd be shocked. That's not, that's not Sean, because any of you who know Sean probably knew him after, like, like, like I did. Uh, and he would tell me some things. I'm like, holy, holy cow. Um, I mean, he'd never lost a fight, and he got in a lot of them. <laughs> Being a bouncer in a bar for a number of years, and there were people who would jump him uh, later, thinking they're going to get revenge, and they'd come up with a group of guys, and he'd just take them all down. And he's like, oh, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> you know, you want to... Try again if you'd like. I mean, he was just that guy, right? And like the, the, the meaning of his name suggests, he began learning <clears throat> that God is gracious because all of his past was wiped out, forgiven, clean, and he changed everything. N- names are an interesting thing. Uh, sometimes names are chosen just because they're popular. Hey, everybody's naming someone George now, so we're going to go George, you know, whatever the name happens to be at, at that p- particular era. Uh, sometimes uh, they're chosen just because the, the parents just kind of like the sound uh, of the name. Sometimes names are given because uh, of a future hope. If we, if we name you this, then maybe you'll become what, what you know, it says the name means. Uh, sometimes names are given because it describes their character. Uh, some, some, some parents will wait a day or two and just kind of watch the little baby and see what they, th- ah, this is what I think this child, you know, and, and they'll name it based on what they think uh, they see in the character of that little child. And sometimes in the Bible, people are given names because God has a plan and it's a descriptive thing. This is who this person is. We're going to name him this because this is going to happen in, in their life. And over the next few weeks, we're going to spend some time looking at the names of Jesus. I mean, it's named Jesus, but there's different names given to him uh, in Scripture as well. They're, they're titles, whatever you want to call it, but, but they're names of his. Uh, it's what the, his name is what the Bible calls a name above all names. <clears throat> that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every, every knee will bow, every man, woman, child, in heaven and earth and under the earth, everyone will bow at the name of Jesus. But he had so many other names. A prophet some 600 years before his birth said he'd be known as Wonderful, Counselor, I don't think people called him that, but that, that, those, those, those are names attributed to him. Mighty God, <clears throat> Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And there's another name that describes him <clears throat> that, that is so critical. I mean, that, that, that elevates him above just a great teacher or a great guy or someone who really could work a crowd, and that is the name Messiah. And that's what we're going to look at today. Anointed One is what it means. It refers to a king who would someday be sent by God to save the Jews and ultimately the world, ultimately us, Messiah. And so today we're going to look at uh, some scripture where Jesus' disciples uh, first are really beginning to kind of figure out, I mean, they've been following him for a while, they've seen him do a lot of things, but now they're kind of starting to figure out maybe who he really is. And he has this huge lesson to give them. And so he takes them to this place, and it's important for us to know the setting, because the setting means everything for this conversation that takes place between Jesus and his disciples. This little teaching moment that he, this isn't for the big crowd, this is, this is just for his disciples. <clears throat> you, you know how, I mean, he lives in the Middle East, right? It's very hot, uh, very dry, <clears throat> desert area, the Middle East. And, and one day he takes his disciples to the base of Mount Hermon. And it's way up north, right, from where, where they lived. So he takes them up north. They're at the base of, of this mountain. And, and it's one of those mountains that was tall enough that even in the Middle East, in their hot desert climate, at the top, at the peak, it, it got snowy in the winter, you know, which is kind of cool in, in a desert setting. Um, and, and so Mount Hermon it would, would have snow in the winter and then the spring would come and then and the water would begin to melt the snow would melt and the water would begin to seep into the ground of the mountain and work its way into the center of the mountain or some of course would come on along the top of the mountain too <coughs> and it would work its way to the base of the mountain and, and the low areas around this mountain were this very beautiful area of Green vegetation, lush vegetation, kind of a, definitely an oasis in the midst of a desert. 
is this beautiful, beautiful place where people would come to just like, oh, I need, a, I need some respite from the desert. I need, I need, I need a, a you know, change of scenery. People would come here and travel for miles to go here just to be in this little area where the water had, had brought refreshment to the ground. So there's waterfalls coming off from, from the mountain, the vegetation's growing. You just don't see that in, in, in a desert. The water that had soaked into the mountain you know how it goes. It started forming channels and so forth and to the point where eventually a large cave at the bottom became a, basically a river, just kind of, not a full river, but a stream flowed out of this cave. It eventually joined together others and became the Jordan River. So this is kind of like the, the, the very beginning of the, the Jordan River where Jesus had been baptized earlier, but it's just up north and it's, it's you know, part of one of the streams that come together. And out in the base of this large cave, <clears throat> it was a very cold clear, refreshing water. I mean, you can imagine this. It's, it's, it's a, it's, like I said, it's an oasis. You know, in a hot desert, you got cold, clear water coming out. You're going to get a drink of that. I mean, you're gonna, people came from miles to, just to enjoy the area. It had been a gathering place for centuries for people. Uh, they, they believed that the reason, many of the people believed it, because, I mean, how do you explain green, beautiful vegetation with cool, refreshing water in the middle of the desert. Well, if you, you, know, if you don't know science and things, you, you just say, it was the gods. The gods must have done this. So they believe that the fertility gods, many of the people in that area, believe the fertility gods lived in the mountain. And it was their fertility powers that just kind of overflowed. And, you know, so, so vegetation grew and animals and all kinds of things were happening out of the base because that's, that was their base of operation. And so people would go to the mountain, specifically to the, this cave, the mountain, of, of the cave and, and where the water was coming out of the mountain and they would worship the fertility gods there. And, and if you know the context, I mean, that means worshiping fertility gods usually meant you engaged in all kinds of uh, deviant sexual behavior. Um, they often included offering children as sacrifices because they're going to give up part of their fertility to, to maybe get more fertility in their farms and more children and so forth. So they would offer one so they could get more back. So a lot of children had been killed in this area as a sacrifice to the fertility gods. And uh, by this time in history, idol worship had become pretty so sophisticated. So it was more than just a handful of altars maybe laying around the area. There were, there were large temples that had been erected to some of the gods of, of their time, of the time of Jesus. So, so by the time Jesus shows up with his disciples, there, there, there's just these huge, uh, beautiful temples around the base of this mountain. Impressive temples. Uh, one of the more popular uh, gods at that time was the Greek god Pan. Um, half goat, half, half human, had the little Pan pipe thing. And, and he was believed to be a fertility god, uh, a god of shepherds, of flocks, of hunting, of music. He was known for chaos, unbridled lust, animalistic lust, wild living. His worship included... Uh, don't engage your mind too much, but every type of sexually deviant behavior you could possibly think of, and probably some you can't. It, it, that was part of the worship of Pan, involved with children and men and women and animals. I mean, it was just, it was, it was just all-out uh, deviant behavior. It was worship of, of, of Pan. And people thought that Pan would enter into this cave where they were standing, in the fall, and he'd go into the heart of the mountain and spend winter there kind of hanging out and sleeping, and that's why everything kind of dies off in the winter, you know. And then in the spring, so he would hide in, in Hades, the underworld, what, what, what was the thought. And then he would come out of the cave in the spring, and that's why that cave became known as the gates of Hades or the gates of hell. And that's the setting where Jesus has his 12 disciples at the base of this mountain, probably standing in the midst of several temples to several different gods in view. Evil acts are going on all around them. The smell of incense is probably pretty strong. The sound of seductive music welcoming people to their temples to compete for worship is probably going on. They've probably already been propositioned by a number of temple prostitutes who are inviting visitors to come into their temple to worship their gods through different sexual acts. They may even hear the sounds of men and women and children, animals being molested in the name of the worship of that particular god. It's possible 
They even can smell the burning flesh of children who are being offered in that area in the name of fertility to these gods. And it's in this context, in this oasis, but yet sewage, that Jesus is standing with his disciples and he asks this this critical, important question in Matthew 16, 13. Who do people say the Son of Man is? Who am I? What's my name? Everybody knows it's Jesus. But no, no, who am I? What are people saying? What's, What's the word? We're in the midst of all these gods. This is the center of worship. Who, who am I? And in verse 14, it says, They said, well, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. The people, the people out there that, that they've been talking to and on the teaching, the ministry of Jesus, there, there's rumblings out there of who this Jesus might be. I mean, he, he was extraordinary, right? So who is he? They believed Elijah would come back one of these days and, and prepare the way for the Messiah. They believed some of the, one of the old prophets would come back and, and, and set the scene for the Messiah. And, and, and so they give some ideas of who they think, John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But notice nobody's saying, well, you're obviously the, the anointed one. You're him. Nobody thinks it's him. Nobody thinks he's the one. Just the, the crowd, the people they've been rubbing shoulders with. He's just the one preparing the way for the Messiah. And so Jesus says, okay, you guys, 12, I've got your attention. Who do you say I am? Most important question ever, right? Who do you say Jesus is? Who do you say I am? And in verse uh, 15, uh, he asks that question, who do you say I am? And 16, Simon Peter answers, he replies, we are the Christ, the son of the living God. Christ means Messiah. It's, it's, it. You're the Messiah. And Jesus answered him, Well, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Okay, you didn't just figure this out. God, God, God whispered this in your ear. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Don't tell anybody, but you have to know who I am. People will figure it out soon enough who I am. You had to know. Let's look at his response to Peter. We call it the good confession, by the way. We, we still say this. Every time someone's baptized, I will ask them, have them repeat, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, my Lord and Savior. You know, we, we have that as part of our baptisms here. Verse 16, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are Christ. It means Messiah. It's the same thing as the word for Messiah. You are the anointed one. I don't know if Peter fully understood what he just said, but he knows Jesus is some amazing messenger from God. He's not just a talented guy. Uh, he, he's not just a, a charismatic guy. He's not just a good guy. There's, there's some God something going on with Jesus. He had experienced too much of Jesus and his teaching to think otherwise. <clears throat> he knew Jesus was more than just a normal human being. So he also adds, you're the son of the living God. We're in the midst of all these temples with, with fake gods and idols and stone gods and, and, and gods that people have handcrafted. But you're the son of the living God. We know you are connected with, with God, the creator, the real God. That's who you are. How else can Peter explain the things he's seen? I mean, he has eyewitnessed things in his ministry with Jesus. A normal person can't just raise someone from the dead. I don't care how charismatic you are, but Jesus had done that. Peter had seen it. A normal person can't just command the winds and waves to stop, and, and, and they listen to him. Nobody can do that. No one has that kind of authority unless you're a son of the living God. Demons don't cry out in fear when a normal person walks into a room with demons in the present. I mean, they might be charismatic, but they're not, that's not going to scare them. They might be a great teacher. That's not going to scare the demonic world. But when Jesus entered the scene, the demons would cry out. Normal, that doesn't happen to normal people. 
Normal people don't command ears to hear and they start hearing or eyes to see and they start seeing or bones to grow or flesh to heal. But Jesus did all of that. All of it. He has to be the son of the living God. You can't even say in the name of Zeus, grow flesh. It'd be good. Nothing. 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 <clears throat> If you're the son of a living God, you can do all of these things. Not a dead God, not a stone or an idol or a metal created God, the real God. And Jesus responds, you're right. Peter, you are absolutely right. That is exactly who I am. You are correct. I am Messiah. I'm the one we've been waiting generations for. I'm the one who God sent. I am the new king of a new kingdom. And as king, I'm going to change a few things. I'm going to change your name from Simon to Peter. And he uses a word that means little rock, like he could hold it in a hand. Your name is Peter. You're a little rock. Okay? That's who you are from now on. I tell you, verse 18, you are Peter on this rock. I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Against this. So he calls, he uses two words for rock there. One, Peter, you're a little rock. When he says, on this rock I'll build my church, there's a different word he uses. He's looking basically at the mountain, because it's a word for meaning like a cleft of rocks, like a, like a group of rocks, a mountain of rocks. He says, on this I will build my church. Your name is Peter. On this I will build my church, Peter. And there's nothing else they could have thought of but that side of the mountain that, that was this place, this center of, of immorality, of temples, of killing of thousands of children over the centuries. They're standing in full view of this cave known as the gates of hell. And Jesus basically says, as Messiah, as the new king of a new kingdom, as the one that God has sent, I want you to understand my kingdom will replace all of that. Yes, it, it seems impressive and daunting, and you think there's no way we could do anything to take down the Temple of Diana or whatever, you know, of Pan and, and the other temples that were there. But trust me, as a new king in a new kingdom, my kingdom will replace all of that. And that's exactly what he has done for the past 2,000 years. Because when Jesus enters a person's life, you know what happens? Innocent children stop being killed and abused. They just stop. We're worried about changing laws. How about we just introduce them to Jesus? Because as a Jesus person, I don't kill children. Sexual immoral, immoral practices stop. Because as a believer in Jesus, as a follower of Jesus, I just don't do that. Of course I do if I don't believe in Jesus. Yet if I'm not following him, if I'm just doing what everybody else is doing, of course I'm going to do it. But now that I'm a follower of Jesus, I don't do that stuff. The worship of false gods, they go away. Because when people become followers of Jesus, they just stop. I will build my kingdom, Jesus says. And the gates of hell, the gates of Hades, shall not prevail against it. Now, now what are gates for? <clears throat> they keep the wrong people out and the right people in. I mean, right? I mean, simplistically, right? And Jesus is known, sitting there, standing there, at what is known as the gates of hell. And he's basically challenging Satan and his kingdom, saying, there's a new king in town. And it's me. I'm the Messiah. I'm the anointed one. And you've seen it work over and over and over in your own life and other people's lives. When Jesus enters someone's life, Satan is out. That doesn't mean we don't battle, we don't have temptation. I mean, I'm, I'm just saying, when Jesus, the Messiah, enters your life, I mean, really enters his life, and you really commit to following him. I'm not talking about uh, some wimpy religion, oh, I go to church. No, I mean, when you really follow Jesus, Satan is out. When someone decides to follow Jesus, they leave Satan behind, and there is nothing Satan can do about it. Oh, he might try, and he might get mad, and he'll stomp his feet, and he'll be upset, and he'll be lost another one. But he can't touch you. The power of hell can try its hardest, but it cannot stop the kingdom of God from barging into your life and controlling you and completely transforming you into a new person. The power of hell cannot Stop Jesus. Because he is the king of kings and he is the Lord of lords. 
Uh, my friend Sean, your friend, many of you who knew him, uh, had been drunk for 20 years. I had a, a fine collection of pornography. Uh, his uh, language was filthy at best. Uh, I mean, you go down the list, right, <laughs> of, of stuff, just stuff you would expect from someone who doesn't follow Jesus. He did a lot of crazy things to get attention, oftentimes just almost hoping he'd get in a fight so then he could just win again. And, you know, why not? Almost hoping to be thrown out of a restaurant because why not? All right. But something happened when he accepted Jesus as his Messiah, as his king. I mean, his life transformed. As Jesus grew stronger and stronger in his life and the kingdom started growing in his life, Satan began getting pushed out more and more. And, and I remember when he told me he got rid of his secret porn stash that I didn't know anything about before that. I'll never forget that conversation. I thought, man, that's a, that's a big day for you. I didn't, you know, I, didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know what was going on. I remember when he, he stopped drinking. I mean, like, drinking, right? I mean, nothing scripturally against having a drink. But I mean, when, when that was like... He became sober. How about we put it that way? I remember when he began to detest the bar life. To the point he, he wanted to stop DJing. And, and, I, and I was the one saying, man, he, they need a light. They need Jesus in there. Um, he'd, he'd gone from 10 DJs down to him, basically. Because he just kept not caring. I, I had no interest in That's not my world anymore. I said, well, that's probably good. You don't need to be paying them to do it because they're partying along with everybody else. But, but, but he was able to be an amazing light as Jesus grew stronger in, in his life in that situation. His language changed. Oh, I'm sure he slipped once in a while. Um, but I, his, his heart changed. His life changed. He became a completely new man when he experienced the grace of God because that's how it works. When you accept the grace of the living God, Jesus becomes the king of your life, and Satan is pushed out of your heart and of your habits and of your life. Because when the son of the living God, the king of kings, enters your world, there's no room for the kingdom of Satan or the gates of hell. I, I, I'll be honest, I was a little bit nervous to do the whale today. Last time I did that was nine years ago at his funeral. And that's how we opened the funeral. Um, it'll be nine years in October. What was he, 46, I think? I'm a young, young, young guy. Um, when he passed away, um, he came to faith at just the right time. I got to see him grow from, from knowing literally nothing to, to becoming a teacher and, and to actually coming on staff here at our church. And, and uh, we, we, were, we were this close to naming him our first elder. Um, we, he, need, he needed time. That was why we had waited, you know, because he was doing all the shepherding. He was doing all the stuff. But, but I thought, you know, you've got to be in the faith longer. You know, you can't just be a new believer, right? Um, and we were getting close. The conversation was coming, is, 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 and, and then when he passed, when he passed away, um, man, what a ride he had in his faith! What a ride! Jesus changed his life. The Messiah came in and radically changed not only his today of his day, but his eternity. His eternity, and and it's it is. <laughs> It brings a little, a lot, not a little, a lot of joy to my heart to think that at this exact, I mean, like right now, he's been gone nine years, but right now at this moment, he celebrates that decision he made to follow Jesus as a citizen of heaven, right? And not in theory. I mean, we used to sit and talk for hours about what's heaven like, you know, and we did the prayer rooms. What do you think, what do you think it's going to be like? And, and like he's there, and he celebrates every second being in the presence of of Jesus Christ. That's the kind of power the Messiah has, and he's been having it in people's lives for 2,000 years, and he still has it today. If you've not chosen to follow Jesus, I want you to pay close attention to these next four weeks. 
including today, next three weeks from now. Pay close attention to the things we say about who Jesus is, the names he goes by, the things about him, who, who is he. We're not inviting you to a church. We're not inviting you to a religion. We, we are inviting you to get personally involved with the Messiah, the Son of the living God who wants to save you. He won't force it. He won't make you. There will be a day you will see him face to face and you will drop to your knees the name of Jesus and call him Lord. He gives you the opportunity to do that ahead of time. If you're ready, talk to me. We'll talk about next steps. Let's get you started on the right path. Would you pray with me?